Hey, mental workers, welcome back to the podcast. So imagine this, you've got a new job. What's the first thing that you think? Sometimes you think, how much will I be paid? How often will I be working? And there's always a question that comes to mind. What do I wear? This podcast episode today is going to tackle that subject. It might seem frivolous or trivial, but honestly, I see this come up a lot and it's something that I've thought about a lot as an early career psych. What do I wear? What's the norms? How do I fit in? How do I present myself to clients? And today to help us with their personal and professional insights is Sarah O'Doherty. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Bronwyn. Sarah is a private practice owner and director of the Australian Association of Psychologists. And I'm very excited because honestly, this episode was actually inspired by Sarah. Sarah <laughs> made a post on Facebook where she asked about what do I wear? And I think it got it got so many comments. It got a lot of interaction. And I was and there was just a lot of good chat in there. And I was like, we need to talk about this. We really do. And do you know what? It does feel a little bit like the question that a lot of people ask about when they're going into a new job. And so many people want to be prepared. What am I going to wear? What kind of an impression am I, am I going to make? And what is the team going to look like? Are they going to accept me? Am I going to fit in with them? So yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Bronwyn. No worries, my pleasure. And yes, I absolutely agree with that because as we know, clothes do communicate a lot about ourselves and I guess who we are, what we do. If we think of a doctor, we think of a stethoscope. If we think of a lawyer, we think of a suit. I guess if we think of a psychologist, we get cardigan? I think it's a drapey cardigan and some sort of large scarf or Jewelry yeah, situation. Yeah, like bead necklace. Yeah. Glasses? Definitely glasses at the end of the nose. I know I've definitely got that happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've got, got these stereotypes of what professionals in air quotations are supposed to look like. And across this episode, we're going to go through Sarah's journey. I think she's got an interesting one with her relationship with clothes across her psychology career. So we're going to go through that. And then we're going to talk about what it says about us as as psychology professionals to be dressing the way we are? And could there be things that we could do to subvert these norms so that we could dress authentically? So we're going to talk a bit about that. And then we're going to do some quick quiet fire questions. Like I'm interested to hear Sarah's opinions on what she thinks about colorful hair, visible tattoos, makeup, piercings, mandatory, not mandatory. Who knows? <laughs> Amazing. I'm excited to kick it off. Excellent. So, Sarah, I would really love to kick off with with your experience. So, could you take us into it? Tell us, do we want to start off with how you think about clothes now or do we want to start back at the start? You know what? I think that starting back at the start would be helpful. Um, so, my very first job as a psychologist was fairly corporate um, I was working in an NGO, working in disability services, and we had a sort of small niche clinical team uh, with lots of other sort of um, additional teams around us. But the vibe was very corporate. So I remember on one of my first days out in the field doing outreach there with some of my clients with disabilities in my black high-waisted pencil skirt and button-down white blouse. Oh, wow. <laughs> and your face is looking like my face right now. It's like, <laughs> what? Who yeah, my face is, is like, I've just eaten like a lemon. I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and boy, oh boy, that was such an awakening for me because here I was trying to translate my experience of being in a very staid corporate environment and then going into literally someone's house, doing a home visit, an outreach, about to do um, a behavioral assessment and report and then a behavior support plan for a particular person who was really not doing well mentally, but then also had an intellectual disability and all of these other things going on in their lives. And I felt so out of place and so out of touch. And it really felt like that sort of top down, I'm imposing on this person. I'm intruding into this person's life, pretending like I'm some sort of an expert. And I was, you know, a provisional psychologist fresh out on this job. And it was absolutely eye-opening. 
And I think what I learned from that experience was we really do start from a place of where am I going to be doing my work? So what is the environment or the landscape of where I'm going to be doing my work? But then more importantly, who am I going to be delivering services to? Who are the clients that I'm going to be working with? And do they feel comfortable with me? And I think that taking myself off that sort of top down, I'm an expert walking into a room kind of pedestal that I think we we do actually have in our early career a lot of the time. You know, I've gone to uni, I've had all of this training and experience in the textbook world, and I want to be able to come in and and help people. Um, And I think taking ourselves out of that expert position and putting ourselves in a much more down to earth, approachable position was my first lesson here. That's really interesting because what I'm hearing is that let's say the CEO of your organization back then walked in and they saw your clothes. They'd be like, great, top work, Sarah. You're doing exactly what we expect. But if we ask the client what they think of your clothes, they'd be like, who the hell is she? Like, why does she think that she's better than me? Like, who does she think she is? Some expert. Exactly. And this was such an interesting balancing act because you're exactly right. There was that sense of I have to report upwards to my team leader and my clinical manager and to the corporate higher ups where I was working. But most importantly, I was working alongside, you know, support workers and house managers of people living in um, supported accommodation and alongside the clients with the disabilities that I was also supporting. And so this was that kind of tension between where do I fit in and belong in a workplace, in an office situation, and then how do I actually show that I can be approachable and people will be comfortable working with me Um, as their psychologist. Really difficult. So what happened next? How did you cope and what did you do differently as a result of this lesson? I started wearing jeans. Cool. (laughs) Um, And I think that trying to find something in a middle ground, which was a lot more comfortable, um, really kind of, I guess, um, was was able to provide me with that sense of balance. Um, And then I think after that, I stopped after I stopped working in that particular NGO. I moved into working in uh, youth mental health. And then one of the amazing social workers who I worked with at the time just said, as long as you are looking like a, what did she say? A clean cut version of some of your clients, then that is the standard that we are working towards. And so she would be wearing, you know, brightly colored Doc Martens and, you know, big hoop earrings. And she had short hair in different colors and visible tattoos, as we were talking about before, all of those sorts of things. And she still managed to look professional because it was all of these fun things, but it was sort of done in this clean cut sort of way. So I took a lot from that experience as well. I really like how she's saying that that's the standard. So instead of professional equaling tight, restrictive clothing that is difficult to move in, it sounds like her definition was as long as you look clean and tidy, you're good to go. Exactly. And I think when I then decided to open up my own practice, I was like, well, I'm the boss. I get to choose what I wear now. And as long as I felt like I was able to deliver a professional service, then did it really matter what I wore and what I looked like? So I still really prefer bright colors. Um, I like lots of patterns, but I'm also able to, I guess, balance that sense of it's clean and tidy and still comes across as being professional um, without it being either too much or something that doesn't look approachable. With being your own boss and being in charge of the clinic, I do wonder, were you ever concerned that other people may judge you? So peers like, Sarah shouldn't be dressing like that, or was this never going through your head? I guess it would have done at some point, but that feels like a lifetime ago. I think that when 
we decided on what the values were of the practice and how we wanted to present ourselves as psychologists and present our practice as um, this type of practice within a fairly crowded marketplace. We wanted to show that we were a little bit different and that we were able to attract and appeal to different kinds of clients. And I think that us being able to dress authentically and look like we were having fun, that I think very much spoke to the kinds of clients that we see a lot of. So, we tend to see quite a lot of young people. We have a huge number of clients from the LGBTQI plus community. Um, We have lots of people of color approaching our clinic specifically for services. So, there are lots of diverse people who appreciate the fact that we're not this sort of cookie cutter, beige psychology practice. And it sounds like when you dress authentically, Sarah, that it does help with your mood as well. Is that right? Absolutely. So I realized that there was this trend called dopamine dressing. And I didn't realize it was a thing until one of my clients actually pointed it out to me. And then when I did a little bit of research and it was actually, the phrase was coined by a fashion psychologist, which I don't know if like we could get an endorsement in that area, but I would happily take one. (laughs) Um, So a fashion psychologist spoke about this idea of dressing for the mood that you want. So whether it is, you know, dressing in a power suit because you want to exude authority and all of those sorts of things, that might be a particular mood. Sometimes it's dressing to be comfortable and relaxed and calm. Um, I very much am a fan of, as I said before, bright colors and different patterns and lots of different um, elements to what my outfit consists of. And that just makes me happy. So being able to authentically show these parts of myself, these parts of my personality in the way that I dress, I think means that a lot of people that I work with, they're giving, they're getting permission to also explore their own creativity and their own authenticity. So it's leading to greater well-being for your practitioners as well. Is that too much of a stretch to say? I mean, I would, I would definitely say so, but also it's, it's, I think it's actually really beneficial for the clients. Yeah. I was thinking that as we were talking through that, I was thinking, you know, we all know that the therapeutic relationship is a big part of what creates change and what creates a sense of safety and what is the engine of therapy essentially. And if we can convey to clients that we are approachable, this is a safe space. uh, We are not above you. We are walking alongside you, I imagine it could really help clients as well. Absolutely. And, you know, there are going to be particular clients, individual clients or types of clients where they're going to see my picture on my website and see my bright pink hair and decide, you know what, this person probably isn't for me. But for every one person that might say that or do that or think that, there are going to be a whole bunch of other people who are going to say, you know what, maybe this person is going to get me and maybe this is going to be the psychologist that I want to work with. I really like that as well. I think that's a great point because then if we all dress authentically, there's going to be some people who love wearing pencil skirts and they rock it and it's exactly their jam. Then there's going to be some people like you who love this dopamine dressing and love the bright colors. So if we all are authentic and we all dress the way that rocks us, then we'll be able to suit clients and a a wider diversity of clients. Exactly right. And I think being able to, you know, tap into who we are as people first and not just as practitioners, you know, we aren't the tabula rasa, we aren't the blank slate. We're not going to just be the empty space for the client to be reflecting off. It is going to be a really human to human interaction. And a lot of the time, in order to feel comfortable with another human, you have to feel like there is that sense of connection or there maybe are that sense of things like similar values, perhaps. And we absolutely convey those things a lot of the time in how we dress. So, things like privilege or money, wealth, um, if we're thinking about class um, or if we're thinking about where we're fitting in to different places in society, that can absolutely be conveyed in what we choose to wear. 
Yeah, I was thinking alongside that. I was like, where does this idea of how we should dress professionally come from anyway? Because I was thinking, okay, there's this expectation that we should have expensive looking clothes. But we also know from listening to people with culturally diverse backgrounds that it extends to hair style, hair colour, jewellery, shoes, etc. And so there seems to be all sorts of rules and norms about how we should dress to look professional, doing a lot of air quotes here. And I'm just (laughs) curious, Sarah, where do you think this comes from? My worry is that... You know, we've inherited this sort of corporate culture, which very much comes from, you know, the UK and the US, very um, Western, Anglo-centric dominated cultures. If you, For instance, if you look at how men dress in corporate environments or in formal environments, there's basically just one thing, you know, it's the suit with the, with the shirt and the tie. Yeah. Um, you know, my long standing supervisor who I still see pretty regularly and I've had him since I was um, a provisional, um, you know, his uniform is basically chinos and a button down shirt. And that is, it tends to be the softer version of that sort of corporate culture. And in my view, it very much seems like, again, that sort of top-down, hierarchical, fairly whitewashed, conservative way of dressing, which doesn't suit everybody. Obviously, there are going to be particular body types and particular I guess, beauty standards that are going to be um, really well suited to that particular kind of dressing. You know, I was talking about the pencil skirt and the button down shirt that I wore as a provisional. I couldn't wear that at all these days after having two kids. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) So I feel like now, you know, there are standards that we might feel like we have to um, take on board, but maybe they don't actually fit for us. Um, And I was listening to this other podcast the other day um, talking about um, African um, hair. So having that sort of Afro um, sort of frizzy hair. And she was talking about how when you Google unprofessional hair, you get all of these pictures of black women with their natural African hair. And it is absolutely this idea of what what the question is, the question is, what constitutes professionalism? And if there are people who are excluded from this standard of professionalism, then they're never going to be able to fit into it, no matter how hard they try. So what we can do is if we dress more authentically, then we can maybe find something that not works for us, but works for the situation that we're working in and with the clients that we're working alongside. What I'm hearing is it could move us forward as a profession as well. Like I was just shaking my head back then. I couldn't imagine doing a Google and then seeing myself represented in the image for unprofessional. That would be shattering to me. So if we change as a profession and we say we're going to accept everyone and you can dress authentically and have your hairstyles and bring your culture, then we're communicating you're welcome here. You are one of us in our profession. For sure. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, there's a lot of pushback, for instance, in certain communities, um, particularly conservative communities, um, traditional masculine communities. Uh, I'm thinking about the men's rights activist sorts of groups um, where they do not like and push back against non-traditional or natural colored hair and that being a marker of a subversion of traditional or um, conservative values. And I think those traditional and conservative values are often what is embodied within corporate culture. So I think that when we start to shift and change um, ourselves and we sort of start to figure out whether those expectations and societal norms suit us? Do they serve us? Do we actually want to be conforming and fitting in with them? Then we can start to subvert those a little bit more and challenge, I think, that broader expectation on our profession. I agree. I think that's a great point. And this is going to lead me to the next big question, which is that, Sarah, how do we subvert these norms? And to kick us off with this discussion, 
I will share with the listeners that when I did my fifth year at university, we were actually, it was a requirement of the course that we had to dress in professional clothes every time we attended a tutorial, a one hour lecture. And I went to Myers and I booked, you can actually get um, free clothes consultations. So you go in there, you book an appointment. I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, and that so they will pick fun. out clothes to you and they'll be like, do you want me to go pick out something? I'll go pick out. And I did that for simplicity. I don't actually like clothes shopping that much. And I walked out with $1,000 worth of a wardrobe. And that was Wowza. to get me through that whole year. And that's a lot of money, but also it was expensive clothes. And I was wearing, I guess I was wearing clothes that I actually wouldn't like wearing. Now I wear jeans to my private practice. But back then I was wearing, yeah, like tight clothes, like the button up blouses, which don't really work for me. And yeah, just clothes that I didn't really like. So, Sarah, is there any way that we can subvert this conformity to to what even our lecturers or supervisors are telling us is the norm that we should conform to? I mean, I feel like this is this is probably going to be about broader systemic change when we start to talk about how we are taught and basically indoctrinated into what we should and shouldn't be doing within our profession. And, you know, I'm aware of a clinic close to where I am, um, where a lot of um, early career and provisional psychologists were being taught and they were being taught that they could only wear black and white. Wow. No colour, um, no outlandish texture. Um, hair had to be, if you had longer hair than sort of shoulder length, it had to be up in a bun. Um, you couldn't have any jewellery of any description, all of those sorts of things. And I think that it really reinforces that idea of that tabula rasa that we were talking about before, that blank slate. And if we're not able to show our humanness, and I know I keep going on about this, but we have to keep recognizing that psychologists are humans too. <laughs> and if we're not showing our humanness, how are we expecting that person in front of us who we are claiming to support how can we expect them to trust us with all of their deepest, darkest traumas to be able to walk with them on whatever healing path they need to be on? And Preach. I feel like this is, you know, it comes back to, as we were saying, 70% or more of the therapeutic relationship is about, uh, of effectiveness of treatment, I mean, is about the therapeutic relationship. So if we're able to maintain and build that really strong therapeutic relationship and relate to each other human to human, that should really be our aim. Yeah. So just going on that, you think hair color other than like brown or blonde is okay? I mean, right now I have magenta hair with a side shave and an undercut. <laughs> nice. One of my clients called it the queer by stealth. Okay. Um, and I just thought that that was a really nice way of kind of going, yep, this is me being part of a community, but not particularly overtly. Yeah. So there's still that sort of, um, clean cut way, not necessarily displaying things too overtly, but it is sort of a little bit out there. And I think having differently colored hair, if that's your choice, go for your life. Um, you know, I wear lots of big, bright jewelry and all of those sorts of things. I like to make my own jewelry, so why not wear it? And I think that being able to do all of those sorts of things, if it adds to your joy, you're going to want to go to work and you're going to want to do your job and you're going to want to, you know, be yourself when you're doing that job. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think of this idea that I heard this on another podcast, actually, and so I'll tell you what I heard. One of the presenters, and they are a psychotherapist, they were saying that they feel that they owe it to their clients to wear makeup. They feel like that's part of professionalism and they don't feel professional without makeup. And of course, we all have different perspectives on makeup, but I'm just curious what you think. I mean, cool beans for you if you've got time and energy and effort to do a full face of makeup for yourself in the morning. I mean, I've got two kids and if I can get them out of the door, <laughs> you know, dressed and clean and teeth brushed and I've maybe run a comb through my hair, then I'm doing okay. Winning. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that Again, you know, it's all about what works for you. I've got a colleague who wears the most beautiful bright red lipstick um, to work. And I'm like, this is 
basically like her signature color. It's amazing that she that she does this. But I don't feel pressure to do it. I own the fact that I don't have a lot of time or energy or effort that I want to put into it. It's not a priority for me, so I'm not going to bother. Is it important to show um, that level of professionalism? I feel like I can show that level of professionalism to my clients in other ways, in the way that I speak, in the way that I carry myself, in the way that I deliver my psychology sessions. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be one thing. No, that's something that I discovered. So I only started doing the jeans last year. So this is after a few years being an early career psych. And I was like, I'm going to go for it. I found some perfect jeans for me. And I was like, I love these. I'm going to wear jeans and a top nowadays. And I think I feel my clients are a bit shocked that I was wearing mostly like corporate wear, the, the corporate wear that I, that I bought during my course. You didn't want to waste the thousand dollars of personal shopping. <laughs> I know, so I was wearing that for a few years, just like alternating each day. So then clients didn't see me in the same clothes. Um, I really like that. If you see different clients in different days, you, yeah. But then again, there's that stigma around women wearing the same thing. And so I could technically just so wear true. the same thing. Anyway, so I digress. Uh, so I learned that last year, that it's okay to wear jeans and a top and I can display professionalism in the way that I act, in the way I present myself. And my key thing that I want to get across to my clients is that I'm providing them with a safe space. And so I feel like being authentically myself with the jeans has really actually helped foster that. So immediately when they come into my office, they can relax. It is a safe space for them and it is about them and their time. Yes, absolutely. And I think also whatever we present as normal, our clients are going to be able to accept that at some point. Yeah. You know, if we see them for a few different, a few sessions, then, you know, they are going to get to know us and recognize that this is just part of what this person does and what this person wears and how this person comes across. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. I agree. Okay, so I'm just thinking of how we subvert these norms. I'm curious about your opinion on two potential approaches. One, I'm going to label the fuck it approach and it's just you come in, you wear whatever the hell you want, everybody else is wearing blazers, tie, pants, and you're just like, I'm wearing something clean and this is me. Take it or leave it, but please take it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of the fuck it approach. <laughs> um, I'll give you an example. Today I went to a fairly corporate lunch thingy and everybody there was wearing suits and ties for the men and I think there were a few other women there most of whom were wearing either black dresses or um blazers and those sorts of things and there I am with my bright pink hair and a bright pink dress and my sparkly silver shoes and I just thought you know what I don't want to be boring I'm going to stand out and this is me. I'm not going to, you know, try to fit into something that I don't necessarily feel I have to fit into. Nice. I, I think that's that's really awesome. Um, the alternative approach I was going to suggest is a graded approach. So maybe if you like jelly sandals, you wear like, I don't know, them one day, but still wear a tie with the jelly sandals. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know <laughs> and then what? over time think- you wear your jelly bracelet and then soon you've got your jelly outfit. So the whole thing is jelly. Yeah. I mean, I think that that would definitely work. I've never seen a jelly top or jelly shorts, but I'm sure they're out there. I'm, I'm sure we could make some. I yeah. think this sounds brilliant. Yeah. One of the things that we could probably think of as, as an example, for instance, is how normalized after, I don't know how many years, tattoos have become. Yeah. And, you know, I can't remember, maybe like 10, 15, 20 years ago, police officers weren't able to show visible tattoos. Oh, I didn't know that. Now, literally everybody has sleeves, yeah. you know. So I feel like there is this cultural shift um, in different organisations and different professions where the more we're able to gradually, gradually, person by person, shift and subvert individually, that's how we get a cultural change. So having visible tattoos I don't think is an issue. Potentially, if we do have visible tattoos that might not necessarily be socially acceptable, um, that might be a different question. But, you know, I've worked with professionals who have sleeve tattoos, who have finger tattoos, um, who have visible tattoos on their collarbones. And 
it hasn't really been a problem. And it's the same with piercings. I think when I first started working in disability, um, I was told not to wear big dangly earrings in case there was some sort of incident. And so it was more from an oh and and safety perspective. Um, and then I didn't wear earrings because I also had babies and they will grab on everything and wrench them out of your ears. But now that I'm no longer in those high risk environments, I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to wear what I'm going to wear. Yeah. And I think that's great. I actually feel a little bit inspired and I hope listeners do too, because what I'm hearing is that we could be at the forefront of this change. Like if we all collectively agreed, like, no, we're not going to actually conform to a standard that is influenced by just white colonialism and what you should wear. And it's quite restrictive. And that tabula rasa approach, if we all collectively agreed that we can be our authentic selves and still be professional and still convey that, then that'd be pretty cool. Absolutely. And I think the other really big consideration um, in terms of what we wear as psychologists is there needs to be a level of comfort. Yes. We're sitting down for a large portion of our work day. And, you know, I, I feel jeans can be really quite restrictive. So, you know, I have a colleague who works solely in telehealth um, and she's in active wear on her work days. And I 100% support that. God, I love that. If you can get away <laughs> with wearing active wear to work, I mean, you know, it's a whole um, COVID pandemic Zoom uniform where it's professional up top and then active wear down the bottom. Sometimes. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> as long as, me too. As long as you're comfortable, then that's absolutely fine. Yeah, because you don't want to actually be, you don't want to be uncomfortable during a session. I guess the same is like if you need to pee or something, like make sure you've got a, a pee break beforehand. Um, you don't want to yes. be not attending to the client and they're like, oh, my therapist is bored of me or maybe they're angry and the pe- therapist is just like, no, this skirt is too tight and I need to pee. Absolutely. And speaking of skirts, you know, I feel like if we're going to wear skirts, then yes, there's probably going to be some rules around it. But I also think that, you know, there's that tendency to over-sexualize people, particularly women and particularly in workplaces. So I feel like there is a lot of scope to maybe broaden what we're wearing um, in terms of the different kinds of clothes that we can wear rather than feeling as though it has to be that sort of restrictive pencil skirt of a certain length. Mm, I agree. And I mean, just to bring that in, it's like, I actually like wearing skirts, but so, I mean, just to give listeners a sense of my body type, it is a curvy body type. So I have large boobs and I have six eyes. And so like skirts tend to go up on me, but I love wearing skirts. And I also love wearing um, tops, but it, there has been an element that I feel that I have been body shamed in the past and over-sexualized. Like I was telling Sarah off air, like when I was 21 and working at a youth center, I was actually at the center of bullying from a colleague who believed that I, my my tops, which were perfectly fine, but were being overly, but were too revealing, but they were honestly just crew cut tops nothing revealing. And then I went to my manager to complain, to ask the colleague to stop bullying me. And she agreed with the colleague and she was like, Bronwyn, you need to wear crop tops. And I was just like, my boobs, they're, they're there. Like, I can't do anything about them. They're just, they're just exactly. there. Exactly. And I think that this is where, you know, that really narrow range of what constitutes professional corporate attire um, or, or any kind, not even just corporate attire, but professional attire, it is so narrow. And I think with all of us with different sorts of body shapes, I mean, I feel like we need to be expanding that range and doing what works for us. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many different body types and really like corporate thing, it really caters to a very um, slim body type. Um, it does. And anything outside of that, similarly to how we're talking about culturally diverse folks, it signals like your body type is not welcome in our profession. And exactly. we really need to welcome all body types. We've got um, our workforce is across the age range and we know that different body shapes occur at different ages because of different medical conditions, just because yes. of bodies are bodies. And I, that's my personal hope and what I want to convey to listeners is that it's okay to dress yourself And we don't have to sexualize ourselves as well. It's just your body. And I hope that that can be expanded. I I hope so too. And I think that there is a lot of opportunity for us to be able to broaden this. And it really does come down to each individual assessing their own needs and whether their own needs have to be dictated to by those societal or cultural or workplace sort of norms. 
Um, the other thing also that I was just thinking of was there really, and this comes back to the whole whitewashing idea, there really is this idea of having no element of your own personal cultural identity on display when you are a mental health professional. And, you know, I've seen so many mental health professionals from different diverse backgrounds, a lot of immigrant um, backgrounds, where they feel like they have to be presenting as white and dressing as white and having their hair straightened as white. And it feels very, very much like they are subjugating themselves to one particular dominant norm. We have to look a certain way. We have to adhere to this particular beauty standard or dressing standard. And it means that, or there's, there's that idea that if we don't dress that certain way, then we're going to be looking unprofessional and it then reinforces the idea that anything outside of this dominant whitewashed culture is unprofessional. Mm, Yeah, we need to change that. Gosh, isn't that sad that they feel like they have to dress white? Absolutely. You know, for instance, I was seeing people um, who were talking about, you know, um, People who um, identified as Indian or um, had, had come from the Indian subcontinent and didn't want to wear their bangles, for instance, to work because they didn't feel like that was appropriate mm. or they didn't feel like they could wear their bindi to work because they, they were told that it looked unprofessional. And this is very much, you know, that, that having to conform idea Um, which excludes so many people of diverse backgrounds. Yeah, it's like when you say that, I'm like, they're not using the word unprofessional there in that you are looking unprofessional. It's really like you're looking unacceptable. Let's let's just call it what it is. It comes down to, to fairly covert racism. Yeah, covert racism because, yeah, that's what I'm like. I'm like, they're not saying they look unprofessional. There's something else going on here and I think it's Absolutely. racism. Absolutely. It, it really is. It yeah. Really is. And I think that's really disgusting how we might, like some people might even hide behind that, like you're looking unprofessional when it's really like you're not fitting into the standard, get back in line. Exactly. Exactly. Mm, makes me feel it's angry, a really Sarah. sad. It's a really sad situation, I think. And again, that anger makes me feel like we do need to be doing something about it, you know. And I had a really lovely conversation with my colleague Avril Cook, um, who loves to talk about decolonization and decolonization practices within private practices or within any kind of organization. And it really does start with the self. So identifying why I'm feeling like I have to conform and then what can I do to present myself in a way that feels more authentic, that feels more representative of who I am and that's how we subvert those norms. I I agree. Yeah, so it really starts with ourselves and it really is being more yourself as much as you can. Some people, they might face pressures or sometimes even consequences. Like somebody might bring them up and be like, look, this is the policy. We've given you pictures and this is what you're supposed to look like. But as much as you can. If you've got a uniform, sure, you wear the uniform. I totally get that. Yeah. But, you know, you can't really be discriminating against an employee or a colleague based on what they're dressing. Because at the end of the day, that is discrimination. So as long as we're able to, again, wear that sort of maybe clean cut version of whatever it is that makes us feel joy, go for that. But I'll never forget there was this one psychologist who I met in my early career. Um, She was amazing. Her her name was Katrina and she was a goth and she was this four foot nothing woman with long dreadlocked hair, some of it black, some of it purple, and all of what she was wearing was black lace. And she was an expert in her field and she got up and spoke at this conference. And aside from all of the amazing stuff that she said about the work that she was doing, the other thing I took away from that was you know what, maybe I can look however I want to look and still come across as being knowledgeable and professional. That is a great lesson. And I think something that I needed to hear and I hope listeners needed to hear as well, because quite often we're 
we receive communications to the opposite. You can't be credible. You can't be professional. You can't be accepted amongst your peers if you don't conform to this particular corporate look. So mm. that is very relieving to hear. And like you found it through your own personal experience that you can dress how you want to be your authentic self and there have been no negative consequences? Um, Not that I'm aware of. And that's probably... I guess the the best bit. I don't have to be aware of it, but yes. I'm also really accepting of the fact that I'm not going to be everybody's cup of tea. And I think that when we are early career and we have that really strong imposter complex and we're really feeling like I have to do the best work that I can, I have to fix everybody and I have to look professional and all of these have to have tos, we also feel like if I don't please everybody, that I'm going to be suffering negative consequences. And look, there are probably going to be people who maybe haven't liked particular aspects of the way that I might present, but I haven't heard anything bad so far. I might do now, but <laughs> I mean, I'm open to it and that's totally fine. And I'm actually really open to people who have different views on this as well, because I think that at the end of the day, we're allowed to be different. And that's the the key takeaway, I think, from all of this. You know, as you were saying before there, I really do want listeners to take away this idea that they really can be and they can dress and they can look like and they can embody whatever kind of psychologist they want to be. Because at the end of the day, they're going to have the clients who are going to want to work with them. And that's going to be wonderful and reaffirming for you as a practitioner. You are probably going to be in challenging workplaces that have different and varying levels of support for how you want to come across. But it really is about taking the time to sit with and accept not everyone is going to agree with me. Not everyone is going to like every aspect of me, but that's also okay because I don't like everybody anyway. So they don't have to like me and that's totally fine. So having that confidence, I think is what I want listeners to take away from today. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful because just to add to that, listeners, it's not wrong to dress the way that you want to dress, providing it's not like you're not using Nazi symbolism and stuff like that, like offensive stuff, be your authentic self. But quite often, I guess the predominant feeling that early career psychs can feel is guilt. And it's like, we're doing something wrong. We're not doing the right thing. But just because we're feeling guilt doesn't mean we've actually done something wrong. We are allowed to dress how we want to dress and express ourselves. Exactly. And we're, we're human. You know, yeah. I think that at the end of the day, you know, we have so many boxes that we feel like we have to fit into and maybe we just need to sit with and be in the box of I'm going to be human today and where do my human needs want to take me? And maybe that's pink hair and a nose piercing, you know, go for gold. Well, I think we'll leave it there then, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And this has been a really good chat about what to wear. Thanks so much for having me, Bronwyn. Always fun to chat with you. Pleasure. And thanks, mental workers, for listening. Catch you next time.